Um, I wanted to just give a little introduction. I don't know if, if uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with the Arabic script. I'm not going to give any technical introduction, but maybe just a little bit of introduction about uh, what led to this project. Um, first, um, I, I want to say that um, there is a stronger relationship between Arabic and Latin that meets the eye. Um, it's a bit of a kind of a strange relationship because they come from the same ancestors, but of course with time they have developed completely differently. And um, not only in the civic function as alphabets, so in that sense they are similar, but in terms of their structure and how they work, is they are very completely different. Um, not for the simple reason of the written and different directions, but they are also Arabic is a far more manual um, writing system. And the reason for that is because it was it, it um, was never really, um, it, was, it was spread over a very big geographic area. Um, a lot of different kinds of cultures and languages adopted it, and it was never really regulated. We did not have a Roman Empire that says this is how you write things. So it's, it's a bit of a, a different kind of approach, although the Arab Empire was a, a proper empire. It was not, it was, the focus was more on the content of, of, the, of the language rather than on the form. Um, then, I, of course, now, I mean, it's, it is cool, of course, in terms of the globalization, but I, mean, I want to say that in the project that we started with the Foundation, of course, globalization was at the essence of it. But it was more of looking at it in a positive way, of looking at it from the point of not cultures trying to, um, you know, um, how to oppress each other culturally, but more actually exchange things and learn from each other and speak from each other in a positive sense. So this is an example of, of uh, the text that is, you know, in the 16th century where Arabic was considered sort of esoteric, uh, mysterious, mystical, um, magical. And so every time a publication was made that wanted to show off that it's intellectual, it would Arabic. In this case, it's, it's a bit different because this is a text. I think it's, a, it's an excavation of the Quranic text. So it's paragraphs from the Quran, and that was the best way to learn the Arabic language. Um, in the Arab world, there's still a question, I think, especially nowadays, where we think that the Quranic language is a very made up language. It's, it's not too natural. It never grew up naturally. It was kind of fabricated to consolidate it from different dialects. And what we have in the Arab world is still different dialects, and people write and think and speak slightly differently. So this text is written for the experts, even in the Arab world. Um, so talking about the varieties, the variety of different cultures and thinking was, is still part of the Arab world, was in the beginning, never changed. There's always a kind of connection between the different things, but also more variety than connections. So this is what the Arabic script looks like. Um, every line that is in this example here is from a different period and different style of calligraphy. And sometimes the styles are impossible to read because they have been written a long time ago, we can't recognize the letters. But sometimes it's also from one region to another, the letter form changes so dramatically. Um, if you familiarize yourself with it, of course you can read it. And that is kind of um, a, a kind of contradiction that was always addressed in the, in the 1920s when there was a big movement in the Arab world by intellectuals who thought we should simplify the language. To make it to make literacy possible or easier, um, but it did it fail because there's something with writing that is not about just reading. It's also about how we see it. It's an image. It's, it's connected to an emotion. It's it's a symbol. It's a sign for where we come from. And so when I look at this variety, I think, yeah, why well, should we simplify it? We should just keep it and actually learn the different scripts. And that's a that's like a, a bigger palette of things we can work with as a designer. So, um, so I started before um, doing the Qatar foundation. I started uh, from by making a book about Arabic typography because, as a designer, I was trained in the U.S. I lived in France and then in, in Holland, and I worked in the West. And then I had to go back to the, to Lebanon to teach, and I just realized I can't actually teach about my own culture, which is really embarrassing, but it's a fact. Um, and then I started to. Because 
of living in Europe, people always come to you and say, if you speak Arabic, then can you be a consultant on typography? Which is, of course, a, a challenge because, yeah, I can read it, but I, I cannot be a consultant and I don't know the history. So that, that got me actually to make this research and to make this book. And the book was surprisingly the first um, written so comprehensively. It was, it was really a collection of somebody who was curious to find out a little bit about you know, what is the script about, why is there a problem, how did it develop in terms of typography, what were the problematics with that. And then, of course, I made a book for myself, really. And then everybody thought it was so good to me. <laughs> so there were more people that wanted to use it. Um, so it was, it was the beginning of, of my career, actually. It was just my own curiosity and frustration. It's a very good lesson for any student. If you can't find something, make it. So don't wait. <laughs> um, so the second 20 years, I think it was maybe 15 years later, we made a variation on that book because, of course, the technology changes over time. So the second thicker book, which is the, the, the big bad book, this, this one is, the first one is this one, humble academic book, and the other one is bigger, thicker book. Um, and what, what the second book did is actually continue on, on more the recent uh, uh, technological developments of font design, but also we collected all the existing Arabic fonts. When I first started my book, there was very few, first it was really difficult to find anything. Um, I, I didn't know any sign designers, but 15 years later there were far more people and there was far more possibilities and then people were interested in sending their stuff. So we ended up with a book that was a thousand pages. The first one was a hundred. So that's interesting. Um, so this is some images from the inside. So this is the first book with all the academic information that was kind of collected from all sorts of sources and probably you know, maybe I also missed some things. Um, and this was what it was looking like um, in terms of presenting the different designers. So there were five individual designers and three on foundries in my book. The second one was, of course, far more developed. So we also had uh, the opportunity, because you make a book, you meet people, so to invite different people to write specific texts. And then the examples grew. So then it became, you know, this is one page, an example of uh, different foundries and then their collections. And what was really interesting about the book, which the, um, kind of upset some designers, was there were work that was there was a lot of free fonts, and there were lots of fonts that looked the same, not as well, you know, drawn. So all of a sudden you could see who was stealing from mm -hmm. We never said anything about it, we everything. But some people were very upset because it was kind of like showing piracy um, in, 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 in working, so it was good. Um, then I wanted, so this is a very short introduction about um, why I was involved in the, in the Hutt Foundation. The second reason is after, in, in 2000, um, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but <laughs> I went back to teaching Beirut and then I started the first book. Then I went after that and I was teaching in Dubai and I started in 2000. And, I was, um, and there I had, I had a very nice experience because all of a sudden I was in, in an Arab world that was really the Arab world because Dubai is very multicultural. Um, also in terms of the geography of the different Arab countries, different Arab people coming from different origins. Beirut is very Lebanese, with a few, maybe some Jordanians and Syrians that come and study. But in, in, in Dubai, I had people from Russia, from uh, India, from Pakistan, from different countries in the Arab world, also from the Gulf, which was a really big culture of the Middle So then you come across really the multicultural mix. Um, even as an Arab multicultural. Um, this is some of the trends after 2.11, a lot of anxiety and us, an awakening. You know, all, all the Arabs, and I think it's only grown since, have become very aware of their own, um, reasserting their own cultural identity and also presenting a face that is not what we, what we associate with the Arab world, which is fanatics, which is uh, uh, religious fanaticism, uh, backwardness, uh, terrorism, you know, all the names of things. So they wanted to really actually look at the culture and say, no, we're going to start to do new things. We're really going to show that this is a living culture, that it belongs in the 20th century, 21st century, and that 
Of course, we are proud of where we come from, but we're going to be interpreted. We're not going to be put in a museum that looks, you know, it's all nice and graphic stuff. That is nice, but it's, it's history. We want to, we're not dead, you know, we're not in a... So this is a bit the visual mix, and then, of course, then you start to say, okay, techno music in Arabic, what does it look like? Or um, fashion that is using Coca-Cola as, as, as a base to, to make uh, chairs, to create an environment, to play with you know, things that you put on your head and turn them into a miniskirt. You know, what, how can we play with this? Um, in terms of typography um, and visual communication, of course, the possibilities are a bit bigger. And then here you see a collection from different poster designers from Persia and also on this side, a, 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 a Jordanian calligrapher who actually made these paints for the crop, crops and shoes. So again, you are playing with the alphabet, looking at new products, looking at people, how they live, looking at the traditional elements and then re, you know, mixing them with other forms. Citing comic strips, which is one of the, this is the first uh, really 20th century comic strip magazine called Samanda that started in the youth where they actually, it's, 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 you can make, you can contribute to it, so you can write in Arabic, but you can also write in French, because some Arabs don't write very good Arabic, you can even you know, propose things in English. And, and they played with all these different stories mixed in this magazine. And then they set the trend, because now all of a sudden the comics strips and comics uh, books and uh, visual novels have become really popular since. Um, again, another uh, direction which is really important for designers but also for, for typographers is children's books in Arabic. For the longest time, children's books in Arabic were either really terrible or uh, just translations of French or English books, so they just put new Arabic text. But actually, the illustration, the whole story is not Arabic, it's not related to this child's environment. So there's a whole new movement of saying, no, we're going to write in Arabic really nice stories that are relevant to different to these different countries, but also playing with the letters, playing with the language, make it accessible, not you know this language of again going back to um, the, the classical Arabic, this language that you read only when you're you know, twenty something. Before that it doesn't relate to your life because it takes too much to learn. Yet people speak Arabic, it's not that they don't so that the disconnection was you have to do that for children, you have to make them proud of their language through making it also visually attractive because that's what they first see is the image, not the text. So this is again the shoes. Then of course, you know, slowly another trend is graffiti. And um, this book is very interesting because they made the trying to make a collection of different uh, graffiti artists from different parts of the Arab world. And then when they launched it, then they started all the real revolution. So all the good graffiti started after the book. So I think we're probably going to do another edition. But what is interesting is also in this book, and you see it on the cover, is there's also this new movement of um, making calligraphy as graffiti. So playing with things like this. So it's anywhere between, you know, the words are, the, the form is very flexible, so you can do whatever you want. So playing with the formal aspect, uh, but also saying text that is contemporary, maybe political, and then still it's calligraphy. So it's a kind of play between, um, you know, graffiti and calligraphy. Um, this is, an, of course, Arabic, again, can be written on anything. It's uh, historically, we've always used it as a sort of visual element, so you have it in architecture, in clothing, in textile, and so on. So it's really nice to see this example of jewelry, which was made of leather, again, die cut out of calligraphy. And it says something about uh, life, celebration, and um, Love, <laughs> like love and like passionate love, not just love and peace. Um, this is another example from uh, a calligrapher who actually started working on design elements. So, with the competition that we started, that she developed um, this image on the left, which is a kind of sticker, so decoration inside the home. So she did this tree of life or tree of letters, and then eventually she made an actual three-dimensional. Installation of that. So again, taking you know the text out of the page and out of printing into the third dimension. Um, another trend is of course looking at how do you cross over. So using again the the, the decorative arabesque um, 
motif, if you want, and then using it as a pixel form that goes in Latin form that looks like it's Arabic, but it's actually Latin form. So this idea of working between the two, the two scripts, as I said in the beginning, is important. It's, it's all over the Arab world, and it's also uh, become so much so important for branding that a lot of companies decide when they want to make a typeface, they can't find an Arabic that matches what they want, they just actually commission it. So that's kind of a trend that is a positive thing because at least it allows new production. Because as designers, we always need somebody to come and say, I need you to design this for me so we can start working. We can't really, most of the time we don't invent things by ourselves. Some do, but in general, we 